All right, today I'm going to talk about the basics of World War One. Last year, you guys talked about the main causes of World War One, which are listed below. The I'm going to start off with imperialism, and essentially, imperialism is the idea of controlling another territory. You would be able to control it either, um, whether that was economically, politically, or militarily, and Essentially, um, European countries wanted, and the United States, wanted um, territories or an empire because it gave them access to more resources as well as markets to trade. It's also kind of a demonstration of power. This is important because, as we talked about the mad scramble for Africa, the open door policy in China, what we saw was that lots of countries in Europe had grabbed territory across the world. By the time that Italy and Germany are created in the 1870s, much of the colonies have already been claimed. So, Italy and Germany both want to have colonies, but they don't have really the territory. There isn't that territory in the world to um, grab. Militarism is the idea of building up your own um, army. And this is something that Germany begins to do. And when they build up their navy, England feels threatened. When they build up their army, the countries surrounding it, particularly France, feels threatened. And so the response by these nations is to build up their own militaries. And this kind of, once everyone has large militaries, this kind of ends up leading to um, conflict. Nationalism is the idea that people, it's often confused with patriotism, but it's really, patriotism is pride in your own country. Nationalism is the idea of pride in your ethnic group. So instead of like Austria-Hungarians being proud of being Austria-Hungarian, it ends up being like Serbs are proud of being Serbs. Uh, Croatians are proud of being Croatians. Poles who don't have a country are proud of being Polish. And it's the idea that they want to be able to run their own countries. And finally, the alliance system is was a big issue because of secret alliances. And once Austria-Hungary goes to war, Germany is also going to war, which leads basically to all of Europe going into war. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But these are the four uh, main causes that you should have studied um, in the last year. And so the spark for the war is that the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is assassinated by a Serb nationalist, who is Gustav Princip. And it's important just because it sets this whole thing in motion. What ends up happening is because, um, basically, Austro-Hungary leads, a, gives all these huge demands to Serbia, because Serbia actually exists, it's just that they control only part of the territory that they view as theirs. So Austria-Hungary leaves, gives Serbia a bunch of demands that they're near impossible to meet. They don't meet them, and so war ensues. The problem is, is that Russia then comes to the aid of Serbia. Germany comes to the aid of Austria-Hungary, and quickly all of Europe is in war. The Triple Entente is made up of Russia, France, and the United Kingdom. There are other nations involved, Serbia, Romania, but that's not really what's important. Central powers are Austria-Hungary, Germany, Ottoman Empire, and Italy. Again, other nations are involved, like Bulgaria, but I'm just trying to keep it simple, because this really is about U.S. history. And what the U.S. response is to not get involved in the war at all to be neutral in fact as well as in name. But the truth of the matter is that the United States wants to trade and make money. And so they really want to trade with both sides, but England has a blockade. So we trade primarily during the war with England and France. There are a lot of new inventions that make World War War truly World War One truly awful. And probably the biggest one uh, is uh, machine guns. And artillery guns, but yes, tanks are used, poison gas, the airplane, zeppelins, uh, submarines, or at least they're new to the battlefield. But the bigger problem with these inventions, the biggest problem with these inventions is really the 
machine gun, which really ends up leading to trench warfare on the Western Front. And so, as you guys studied last year, there wasn't a lot of progress made. I mean, they have poison, the poison gas was terrible, as, and submarines is what brings the United States into the war. And we're going to talk about that. So, the United States, basically the sinking of the Lusitania, it's a passenger ship. Americans are on board. This infuriates Americans and gets people um, frustrated. But Germany is also trying to have a blockade on England. But they don't have a navy full of battleships. Their navy has a number of submarines in it or U-boats. They, they can't just pop up and stop ships because then everyone knows what the U-boat is. So their uh, policy is to sink merchant ships. The problem is that the Lusitania is a, merch, is a passenger ship, but it also has war material in, on board. So they sink the Lusitania. This angers a lot of Americans. And finally, they sink a ship called the Sussex, which is also a passenger ship. And as a result, the Germans uh, sign the Sussex Pledge. In short, the Sussex Pledge is to not sink passenger ships. Um, there's a Zimmerman note which the Germans decide to try to get Mexico to fight the United States. And this is basically was a telegram intercepted by the British who send it on to Americans. And this was basically to keep the United States busy because they didn't want the United States to join England and France, who it was looking like they, would, they were very clearly going to side with as we had trade relations with them. And those two countries were democracies. So, there's also Allied propaganda, which we're going to talk about. The economic interests, just because we trade with them. And this idea of, Link, of Wilson's that we want to make the world safe for democracy. This is because England and France are democracies. Austria-Hungary, Germany, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire are not. Russia, before it drops out of the war, has a revolution they, for six months before they turned to communism, they were considered by the United States a democracy. I wouldn't necessarily say that they were truly democracy, but that's not really the point. These ideas of making the world safe for democracy was led the United States, also led the United States to declare war. Um, and here is some Allied propaganda. It's talking about like the bond. If you see like Second Liberty Loan, Uncle Sam stamp out the Kaiser, buy U.S. bonds. A bond is loaning the U.S. government money, and so Americans were encouraged to buy bonds to show that their their support and their patriotism. This allows Amer America to buy war supplies, including ships and trained soldiers. This poster here is basically a message that is asking everyone to work as hard as they can because what they're doing in this factory is producing war supplies like, let's say, sh ships. The reason that this poster existed was, yes, to promote patriotism and it's sort of a guilt trip, but it was this fear that with soldiers gone, that meant that there were fewer workers in the factory and that factory workers would go on strike for higher wages. This is partially caused by inflation that existed. And those workers, as a result, needed more money to live. We'll talk about that again momentarily when we talk about the War, la uh, the war Labor Board. But, so George Creel created most of this propaganda. He headed a government agency called the Committee on Public Information, which is a nice way of saying it produced U.S. propaganda. And it produced these pieces to help keep people focused on the war and to remain loyal. Speaking of loyalty, the nation questioned whether German-Americans were loyal to the United States, and there was a lot of rumors about spying and sabotage. There were um, definite examples of sabotage uh, committed by German-Americans, but there are very few. And as a result, people didn't trust Germans, and so we have passed both the Espionage Act of 1917 to prosecute people um, for spying on the nation, giving the nation's secrets away. Only 11 people have ever been um, 
convicted, uh, not convicted, um, charged with crimes under the Espionage Act, and seven of those are actually under the Obama administration. The Sedition Act of 1918 is talking, is against speaking out against the war. And so, again, this is the fear of German Americans, but really also anti war protesters. And so, one example of this is that in Shank versus the United States, where Shank was speaking out against the war, he was punished um, and sent to jail. And in the case, Spacey says that you can limit the freedom of speech when your speech poses a, a danger to the nation. The example of Shank probably is not followed in today's government, but it really does, I mean, it would basically say that if you're protesting Vietnam, um, that this would could potentially uh, put the nation in danger. Because Shank was arguing that you should not register for the draft, which is actually very similar to what the Vietnam protesters were saying. Um, essentially, we, to promote industry, the United States created the War Industry Board, and it was encouraging people to produce more uh, goods and war material, and actually it did, didn't actually do much, it was mostly just kind of cheering people, um, companies on to produce more, but there was like a 20% increase in production. And the War Labor Board is what I was re referencing earlier, is that essentially there were a lot of labor shortages and they were afraid of strikes because of this inflation. So the War Labor Board, essentially, instead of having a strike, you sent your complaint to the War Labor Board and inevitably the War Labor Board supported labor. So if you wanted higher wages, labor ended up getting the higher wages. This was to make sure that strikes didn't happen. So, once again, we see this quote, make the world safe for democracy. This is Wilson's quote because this was the speech that he um, was defending the war but, and saying that we needed to protect the um, democracies of England and France and to a lesser extent Russia, though they drop out of the war as we enter. And to do all this, they needed both men and money. So money was um, done through victory bonds, which we saw, which is just a loan to the government. The 16th Amendment, as we discussed last unit, is the idea of a higher income tax, and that was passed to help allow for the legality of an income tax, which is what we still use to raise money for the government today. And the draft, um, which is also known as a selective service, allowed people to be, or men to be um, entered into the army kind of without a volunteer army. Unlike the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and recent American conflicts, really World War I permeated American culture on so many different levels. Keep in mind you have the propaganda everywhere to keep people focused on the war, but it also just affects what people are wearing. Like leather boots go out of fashion so that American soldiers have more leather. Um, to have boots to go into the trenches. And you just have, you know, just entire fashion changes so that people can be considered patriotic and known as supporting the war effort. Other, a few other things change, like daylight savings is created, which doesn't really save a lot of energy today, but the thought was that it would save it in that time period. Probably the most important things that affect the United States are the Great Migration, which is basically African Americans leaving the South to come North. This is in part to come for jobs in American factories. It's also due to a pest called the boll weevil, which basically destroyed a lot of the cotton crop. And of course, as we discussed um, in previous lessons, the horrors of Jim Crow and the oppression that existed for African Americans in the South. So, basically, these are all different reasons why African Americans come north, and it is a period, a large, it fuels this huge migration of people north. And, as we've mentioned several times, the 19th Amendment is also passed. In some ways, it's a war measure because women are taking on uh, a larger role in the United States. I'm going to cut us off here, as these are kind of the main parts of America on the home front. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me in class.